talk is going to be really different from all the other uh, talks because I will have only one slide on automatic speech recognition and all my other slides about are about humans and that humans make errors. Um, so you're warned. <laughs> okay, so my talk is about uh, casual speech and uh, what I'm really interested in is that if you listen to casual speech, it sounds all yeah, natural because you hear it all the time. But when you listen carefully to it, then you will hear that there are many sounds uh, that you think are present are actually not there. So what you see here is a uh, sentence that has been spliced out of a you know, casual conversation between people speaking American English and it sounds like this. So it sounds like normal casual speech, but when you listen closely, you will see that probably has not been produced with three uh, syllables as in its citation form, but with only two. Another example, this is an example that is in a sentence that has been uh, broadcasted on the uh, British radio, it sounds like this. He's been the top of the British government there for uh, 12 years. Okay, what I'm interested in here is the pronunciation of the word British government because this is more or less a transcription. You can hear it well if you listen to these two words in isolation. British government. British government. Okay, don't think that this is something of English because uh, you can find it in many languages, at least in many European languages. You see here some examples. Uh, the blue segments are the segments that are typically there. The gray segments are the segments that are often absent. So for instance, take the, the French word fenêtre is often pronounced like fenêtre, that's it. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that this is really a very frequent phenomena. So uh, Keith Johnson investigated this on the basis of the Bakar corpus and he found that uh, one out of four word tokens in this corpus of casual speech lacks at least a single sound and that there uh, are about 6% of the words that lack a complete sound. And uh, simil similar figures have been found for French and Dutch. So this is really very common, very frequent. And this is the topic of this talk. What I will to do today is first argue that these reduced pronunciation variants, as I will call them, um, are no speech errors themselves, but that they do induce errors. And they, uh, the reason for this is that they are really difficult to, uh, to understand, even for native listeners under some conditions, but especially for non-native listeners and also for automatic speech recognizers. Okay, so the first point that I might like to make is that these reduced pronunciation variants are no speech errors. And there are still people who claim this, but I think that this is not correct. And I have three arguments for this. And the first one is that these reduced pronunciation variants are very systematic and they're very frequent. So you always find more or less the same reduced pronunciation variant of a given word. And they're really frequent because take the French words revue and mesure, they are more often pronounced without the soi, so as revue and mesure, than with the soi. If we're going to say that these are actually speech errors, we have to say that French people are making errors all of the time. And of course, we don't to dare to say that here. Uh, a second reason is what you see is that the re reduced pronunciation variants are, are often very different from the citation forms. So there's really quite a distance between the two forms. And I think it's very difficult to see how, for instance, uh, the Dutch word uh, for natuurlijk, meaning of course, the reduced pronunciation variant uh, could lead to the reduced pronunciation variant took by just an error. So how would you come from natuurlijk to took if it is just an error? And the same holds for another Dutch word uh, or the phrase, by voorbeeld, meaning example, which is often produced as fault. Well, I, I wouldn't know how this would be a speech error. A third argument that I have is that what you often see is that these reduced pronunciation variants at a certain moment turn into the, the citation forms, so the, you know, the formal forms. And again, I wouldn't expect that a, a form that is the, re the result of a speech error in the end becomes the citation form. So I hope that I have convinced you with this, that I think that these reduced pronunciation variants are no speech errors. 
even though we are in a conference on errors. But they do induce errors, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, and I'm going to tell you an, about an experiment that I carried out already a long time ago. And I did this experiment with uh, young, native, healthy listeners. What we did is we uh, had a corpus of uh, casual speech in Dutch, and I uh, spliced out fr phrases with uh, words in there. And these words could be reduced, highly reduced, or a bit reduced, or not reduced at all. And I presented these phrases to uh, Dutch native uh, listeners. Um, and they got a whole phrase. Um, so at least what was prosodically a phrase. And in this case, um, the target word was mogelijk, meaning possible. So these people heard something like this. And we asked them just to write down what they heard. Then there was a second group of people, and they got the same stimuli, but in this case, they only got the target words and uh, the, the surrounding vowels and the intervening consonants. So whereas the first group still got some kind of semantic and syntactic context, these people only got phonetic context. Because they got the surrounding vowels and the intervening consonants, they knew what the speed rate was of the phrase, and they could also hear whether assimilation might have taken place. So they could take that all into account. And then there was a third group, and they got nothing of that at all. They could just the words in isolation, so they would hear something like. More. More. And well, as you see, you know, this is pronounced as mook, uh, but it is uh, written as mogelijk, so this is really a reduced pronunciation variant. Here you see uh, what people did. So what you <laughs> see here is the percentages of errors for the words that were hardly reduced and the words that were a bit reduced when they were presented with the context with very little context, only the vowels, the surrounding vowels and the intervening consonants, and if there was no context at all. And what you see is that, well, yes, there were some errors in case they didn't get any context, but overall it wasn't that bad, because at least in one out of five cases, they were able to write down the target words. But this was completely different for the highly reduced uh, variants, as you can see here. So in context, it was still okay. When people got very little context, they made already you know, errors in one out of three cases. But if the words were presented in isolation, then one out of two cases, they couldn't recognize the target words. So what you see here is that the reduced pronunciation variants are fine for native listeners, healthy, young native listeners, as long as they present it in context, because if they're presented out of context, we can't do anything with it at all. Okay, so these were the young, healthy native listeners. We uh, replicated this experiment with two other groups of listeners. What you see here is, um, because we also replicated this uh, experiment again with young, healthy uh, listeners, just to make sure that everything was okay. And here you see that, that we got the same results, but the re results are depicted in a different way. So now you see the percentage of accuracy and uh, here this is highly reduced, medium reduced and low reduced when the words were presented in isolation and here when they were presented in the sentences. And again you can see that people were better in recognizing the words when they're presented in sentences than in isolation and that they were better in recognizing the uh, words without any reduction than the words that were highly reduced. But what we were really interested in here was what do people do uh, when they are older. And we know that when people grow older that they uh, don't hear that well anymore. And we thought, well, maybe that might be problematic for them. Uh, but we also know that when you grow older, also processing gets more difficult. So what we did is we tested people that who were over 60. Um, and in addition, we had an, another group of young, healthy listeners and uh, we made them listen to the acoustic signal, but then we had filtered it, so that what these participants heard in the end was similar to what the older people heard because of their hearing problems. Here you see uh, what we found. So in general, you see that the older people and the people who didn't hear, the, say, the, the clear acoustic signal, uh, did worse. And, um, so even in context, now you see that these reduced pronunciation variants uh, are, are difficult. So when you grow older, this is what's going to happen to you. 
uh, in isolation, um, yeah, you see it is really problematic and, and you can't uh, uh, understand these reduced pronunciation variants anymore. Okay, so uh, we have done many more experiments about how uh, human listeners understand these reduced pronunciation variants. And uh, what you see here is more or less the conclusions that we have. And that is that we think that uh, native listeners are very sensitive to the acoustic signal. And not only to, say, the acoustic details of the signal in the word itself, uh, but also in the, the acoustic uh, details of the context. Of course, they are also sensitive to the semantic and the syntactic uh, information in the context. And what we believe in addition is that at least for some of these reduced pronunciation variants, that we have stored them in our mental lexicon. Okay, so this is about uh, native speakers. Now I'd like to go on with non-native speakers. So as you have might experience yourself, um, uh, it is the case that after, say, six years of study of, an, of another language, you are able to really uh, hold a conversation with someone else in that other language if that other person uh, speaks very carefully. But then if you go to a party, then you're completely at loss and it is very difficult to understand these people in the other language. And I had the impression that this may have something to do with the reduced pronunciation variants. And this is what we investigated in three series of experiments, which I'm going to present to you now. And every series um, uh, tests uh, learners of a different uh, uh, proficiency. So we started with people with a very low uh, proficiency. These were uh, learners of Dutch. And what we did is we made a, uh, a dictation task especially for this experiment. So we, you know, we came up with some sentences and I produced them in a very careful way and in a casual way. And because we know that uh, learners really have problems with a high speech rate, I tried to speak them uh, very slowly. And this is the result. This is the, the sentence uh, that contains the reduced pronunciation variants. Het openbaar vervoer is nauwelijks verbeterd de laatste jaren. The results were not completely what I expected. Because what I found is that for some of the reduced pronunciation variants, these learners didn't have problems at all. What you see here is the full form openbaar vervoer, which means public transportation. And in this dictation task, it was pronounced like openbaar vervoer. Okay. And so uh, what we see now is that actually people didn't have problems with this reduction at all. And what I think that is going on is that there's only one syllable left out of a phrase that actually contains many syllables. And probably that was the reason that they could easily overcome it. For other reductions, they did have a lot of problems. So for instance, in Dutch there is the word uh, daarom, meaning therefore, and it can be pron uh, pronounced as daam, so daarom instead of daam. And then you see that this is really problematic for these learners. So we had, uh, nobody had problems with understanding the unreduced form uh, daarom, but six out of eight had problems understanding daam. So here we see evidence that indeed uh, learners have problems with these reduced pronunciation variants. So then there is another series of experiments which we did with people with a higher proficiency. And what we did is that uh, we uh, gave them some sentences that have been broadcasted at the British uh, radio uh, to these uh, Spanish learners of English. And we just asked them to write down the sentences. So the sentence included the sentences that I just played to you. He's been the top of the British government for uh, 12 years. And here you see what people did with British government. Yeah, so some people uh, yeah, stick to the number of syllables that they heard. Others try to uh, apply some reconstruction, but you see that it is really hard for these people. Okay, um, then the third uh, series of experiments. Uh, we did an auditory lexical decision experiment uh, with uh, Dutch learners of French. And these are, these are really high proficiency uh, learners because they had six years of French at school and now they are studying French at university level. So they did an auditory lexical decision experiment, which means that they heard lots of words uh, and then they had to say for every word whether it was an existing word in French or not. So for instance, they heard pelouse and then they had to say yes. Um, in this experiment now, we had many words that like pelouse contains a swa. 
And in some of the pronunciations of these words, we had left out the swa. So some people heard pelouse, and other people would hear plus. Um, and we were interested how well people would do with the unreduced words and how they would do with the reduced words. And we also carried out this experiment in Paris to see what native uh, listeners do with this task. And here you see the results. So what you see here is first uh, the errors that people made for the unreduced and for the reduced pronunciations. Well, you see that even for the French, they uh, made more errors for the reduced pronunciations and for the redu unreduced. But you also see that the difference between the reduced and unreduced is much bigger for the Dutch learners, even though they are really highly proficient. If we look at the reaction times when they uh, press the correct button, you see that, again, the French uh, are slower for the reduced and for the unreduced, but also that the difference is bigger for the Dutch. And this is all statistically significant. So what you see here is that even people who spent years and years uh, on studying a language and also went uh, to the country where that lang language is spoken for several months, uh, they still have problems understanding these reduced pronunciation variants. So they are difficult. Okay, so they're difficult for natives, they are at least some natives, they're difficult for non-natives. And here I wrote down why I think they are difficult for the non-natives. And I think that for the non-natives, the, yeah, they are more focused on the citation forms of the words, because that is what they learn all the time during the classes. And uh, also the, the ortho orthography is much more important for non-natives, and this orthography reflects uh, the full pronunciation variance. The other thing is, is that um, non-natives are likely not to be as sensitive as natives to uh, specific details of the acoustic signal that might be important. Okay, now here's my one slide about automatic speech recognition. Uh, what I wanted to say here is that these reduced pronunciation variants are also difficult for automatic speech recognition. What we tried is that we took all the stimuli that I told you about uh, in the first experiment, so where we uh, presented phrases to native uh, Dutch listeners and they had to write them down. We also uh, fed them to an automatic speech recognizer. And if the automatic speech recognizer contains a lexicon with only one pronunciation variant for one word, it can't do anything with these reduced pronunciation variants. So it's really a mess, it doesn't work at all. So then, you know, the logical solution would be to just add reduced pronunciation variants to the mental lexicon. Uh, this helps. So the reduced pronunciation variants we were interested in were indeed recognized much better now. Uh, but we also see many other types of errors now. Uh, and the reason for this is that if you add reduced pronunciation variants to your mental lexicon, you are adding many homophones uh, to the lexicon. So you get a lot of uh, competition. And uh, also many words are then uh, have uh, very short uh, pronunciations. So if you have a sentence and suddenly many words come up because you know, they could still fill in there uh, with a reduced pronunciation variant. So how to solve this problem? Well, maybe you have a solution. Okay, so here is my uh, conclusion. Uh, pronunciation variation typical of casual speech is no speech error by itself. Uh, it can only be well recognized in its natural context, and it presents difficulties for learners, listeners with hearing problems, uh, older listeners, uh, non-natives, and the automatic speech recognizer. Thank you. Did you conduct such uh, extra reductions like for British government uh, when the, the, the words were outside before in the discussion? Sorry, could you, could you repeat this? Yeah, the question is when you have extra reductions like you had for British government, uh, did, uh, did British government was already said before in the test? I'm sorry, I just don't get the question. Yeah, I can, I can try to oh, good. repeat that thing that I have got. Um, very thing what you observe is that if you have a very strong reduction, like for the British government, like the British government, yeah. uh, it appears when before the same speaker already said British government 
but a little bit more clearly. Yeah. And then it's a repetition, so it's already instantiated and you can reduce very strongly and it will be no problem for this. That is true. So what you see is indeed that the more often you use a word in a conversation, the more it is reduced. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you get the, uh, reduced, the highly reduced pronunciation variants only when uh, the word is a repetition. Because uh, especially for, for function words or very high frequency words, they are also reduced uh, very much even though they are the first token in the conversation. Yes, but, but they are... Can I just speak to that? Because I've been thinking about it a lot. I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been thinking about a lot recently with respect to an experiment that sort of went wrong um, done on Canadian, Canadian and British English vocoded speech um, uh, where the results are asymmetrical with the Canadians uh, we've got Canadians listening to Canadian and British listening to British and also Canadians listening to British and British listening to Canadians and the results are weren't the way we wanted them. And I actually came to the conclusion that it is because of this type of British government thing. The question was very well founded, you're absolutely correct. It's probably, I don't know, but it's probably more likely to happen when it is more predictable. But actually, it's a characteristic of Southern British speech now. It happens a tremendous amount in certain communities more than in others. And um, it doesn't seem to happen in the Canadian sentences at all that we've got. Um, and, and so you've got a, a, a regional accent difference there as well. But the Canadians couldn't deal with it. And the British people listening to Canadian did not have to deal with it. Yeah. Well, that's, that, is, that is completely what I would expect because what yeah. you see is that how people reduce is language specific. So even if you look at Dutch, the way the, the Dutch reduce is different than the people who... Well, it's, it's the actually accent specific. Well, it's the, it's the same language. because that's what I wanted to say because if you compare the Dutch with the people who are living in Flanders and also speaking Dutch, you already see differences. So yeah, I'm but, not but, so but I think what I, what, I, what I think also needs to come out here is, is that the point that Miriam has made is it is still problematic in adverse listening conditions, even for the native listeners, yep. um, or, or it can be. It's just a sort of adi additional problem, this type of, of, it, of yep. vision and, and so on. And particularly that one, because there's so much devoicing involved, so it doesn't carry through in that listening. Yeah, but you need to take into account that this British government is just one example. I mean, there are many, many more examples in English, but also in other languages. And uh, yes, it is the case that the more often you say a word, the more it is reduced. But there are many words that are also already highly reduced when they uh, are used for the first time in a conversation. So you can't say it is just all priming and then it works. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It, it is a factor, but it's not a complete story. Um. You may have misunderstood when you were originally trying to demonstrate that this is how a speech error. You said that the um, method of production was consistent. But one of the things that the Buckeye purpose so beautifully demonstrated was that there are many different ways that you can do that is true, but it is still language specific. So for instance, if you look at intervocalic T in English, before, for instance, in American English, what you see is that this is turned into a flap and then that flap can be weakened. But if you look at intervocalic T or D in Dutch, for instance, it becomes never a flap. Instead, it becomes a, a J. So instead of rode, you get rode. So you, you still see that these are systematic patterns that are language specific. So they're systematic within the language, yeah. not idiosyncratic. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm uh, completely convinced that you're right about these not being speech errors, but I think the argument that they're common and occur in the same way is has a weakness, okay. which is that if you look at uh, at typographical errors, um, there are many typographical many typing errors that are also extremely common and occur in quite the same way, and nevertheless we tend to regard like teh as an error. So some people, of course, have adopted that they're real word, or, or say government spelled without an N. Okay, I see your point. Okay. This is, I'm not trying to argue yeah, but against even, your Yeah, okay, but yeah, so maybe. Correct. So but what you see is that, uh, for instance, with these French words, or uh, also with many of the Dutch words, that the uh, reduced pronunciation variants occur much more often than the citation forms. 
And I assume that that is not the case when we're typing words. Yes, probably. So it's, it's really of a very high frequency, at least for some words. For some words. Yeah. But, but then all the orthography you see in the social media, are they uh, errors or...? Uh, well, some, some are. Some are and some are different. Yeah. So but, but they're the Well, but you can, yeah. I mean, we noticed years ago in the Associated Press Newswire, um, which is edited and not, you know, social media adopting various spellings, that uh, government spelled with its first N missing was something like the 400 commonest yeah. word. But what is, what's really neat is that what you now see is that these reduced pronunciation variants also uh, occur now in, in orthography. Yes. So in emails and SMS. Yeah. And so you see that people are aware to some level to these reduced pronunciation variants. So maybe fit in one more question. Do you want to follow up? Um, yes, is the difference. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I like the experiment work that you've produced in most of its respects, but I'm wondering about doing things like presenting reduced forms in isolation and measuring reaction times, because the context is entirely wrong. And We're talking about the French, the French experiment, the lexical decision experiment? Um, I can't remember if it was lexical decision. With a non native. It doesn't make any difference to the Well, because that one wasn't in context, so in that sense it, it does make a difference. So it's about the words where the swa can be absent in French, and we know that it hardly ever occurs when the words are presented in isolation. No, so it wasn't the French one. Oh. Sorry. It was the one where it was, it was Dutch and you've got smell somewhere. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, only smells yeah. in the word. Yeah. And um, first of all, you would take you saying that people have got a context when actually you've locked off the beginning of a meaningful word. So they've got some sort of a phonetic context, but I wouldn't call that much of a, a useful context. I wouldn't say they can get... No, that is only the second condition. So in the first say... Yeah, in no, but can I okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we often argue, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so a phonetic context is not just a bit of a vowel here. I mean, if you lock off the snook from snell, then you haven't got the rhythm because the L that's left is not the L that would have been said if the word were L. Um, and so I worry a little bit about that. I worry even more about just giving a reduced form with silence on either side because the context of a word with silence on either side should be the citation form. And therefore, it's no wonder the reaction time is longer. It's just, it's, it's entirely predictable because it is in entirely the wrong context. What might be a way around this, because I, I understand what you're trying to do, and it's good you're trying to do it, but what might be a way around it is to actually produce, uh, to, to put, put the reduced form in noise. So it itself is not in the noise, but the noise is on the side of it, and the type of noise might be modulated such that there were an appropriate rhythm or something like that. You could do this with Martin. And um, so, so that it's a bit like a sort of phonemic restoration thing. And, and then if the reaction time was still longer then, I might be more convinced. But I'm not very convinced by presenting a reduced form in isolation and saying it's harder to understand. Of course it is, it's in the wrong place. A colour is harder to see in a different illumination unless you've got other colours around it and, and so on. I agree, but what we see also with other experiments now, for instance but with ERP, is uh, even in sentences we still find that these reduced pronunciation variants are harder to understand. And I don't really want to believe this, so we definitely have to do more work on this, but this is what we find again and again, that even <coughs> when reduced pronunciation variants are <coughs> presented in context, they are more difficult. So, well, but, but you, were, you were right that we still have to do but, much but more. That's also yeah. really interesting, then, if I could just say one more thing. And, and that is, if that's the case, then, then that's extra interesting. Um, because possibly, then, what's, what is that you're asking people to identify a word in a bigger context where the point is that whole context is not the identification of that word, which is sort of, you know, related to task, getting the appropriate task. Absolutely. So, so if I can interject, I think this is a discussion.
discussion that would be really good over a collegial beer or wine or something. But I want to make sure we don't just have a minute to thank our speaker.